today, I wanted to encourage us to be a church that is equipped. As we grow as a church, we definitely want to maintain the family aspect of the ministry, but we want to make sure that we are equipped with God's word, which is the Bible. To be equipped is to prepare for a particular situation or task. The the Bible defines it as being made adequate. And as this year comes to a close and with the new year on the horizon, we have to be prepared for what is ahead. The word of God has the ability to prepare us and all of humanity for every single part of our lives. It has the ability to not only lead us to our purpose in life, but also to te- it teaches us how to fulfill it. And for those who are visiting today and for those who are new to studying and reading the Bible, I want to let you know something. The Bible is the greatest book that you will ever read. The Bible truly has all the answers that you need to life. And the questions that go unanswered are probably for our own good. The truth is that we're all seeking something in life, right? You might be looking for a community. You might be looking for a romantic relationship. You might be looking to get into a better financial situation. You want to be a better student or you need advice on parenthood. Whatever it is that you're seeking, God has an answer for it. And for those who are members, I want to encourage us to continue to strive after going after God's word. I'm encouraging us because the scriptures encourage us. Paul says this to Timothy, preach the word and be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. So whether you've been here for a long time or for a short time, let's strive to be equipped by the Bible. Let's strive to read it frequently, ask it questions, study it out, practice the words of God. Because no matter who you are or where you are in life, the word of God has something to say to you. But the real question in all of this is are we willing to listen? Being a part of this amazing church uh, for some time now, for some years, I've met so many people who listen to God's word. And even more than that, they are truly taking biblical training to heart. They have taken multiple classes about biblical literacy, eisegesis, exegesis, hermeneutics. They have fought in prayer and wrestled with scripture to not only know the Bible well, but to help others know it well. There are those who have invested time and money to enroll in classes and courses. There are so many who go the extra mile to know the word of God. And all this is so that they may be equipped. And so in my own life, striving to be equipped was not slash is not, it's an ongoing process, um, the easiest thing for me. You know, I don't have the natural desire to sit down and read. It does not come naturally to me. Uh, I'm one of those people, I have to keep moving, I have to be fiddling, I have to do something. I don't have a brain that picks up biblical concepts easily. I wasn't someone who was raised on scripture or in the church. And to be honest, I feel like I'm a slow learner in most things. So imagine trying to fathom and communicate the concepts of God. But what motivated me years ago to take equipping seriously is because of what I believe about the Bible. It's also, it's not just what I believe, but it's what the Bible is and what the Bible can do, right? So like I said before, the Bible is the greatest book we can ever read. It comes straight from the mouth, the mind, and the heart of God. There's a book that can do anything that no other piece of literature can do, which is speak into every area of your life. These are the foundations of life and everything that has been made. And because of that, there is nothing more that I want to know than God and his word. Something that is important about being equipped by the word of God, though, is that it's not all about discipline, right? It's actually about loving it. The Holy Spirit, who is the advocate that will remind us of Christ's words, thus equipping us, um, doesn't want us just to be memorizing scripture or have a plethora of biblical knowledge. But what he wants us to do is to truly fall in love with his words. And so this is what Jesus says. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. 
These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind, remind you of everything I have said to you. So overall, it is God who will equip us through his word, through his son, through his community, and anything that he sees fit. But today, I hope to inspire us to continue to be eager, to be equipped, and to love God's word, despite what we may or may not know. And so this morning, there are so many ways that we can equip ourselves. We could make a whole series about equipping with the Bible, but I only have one morning <laughs> to inspire you guys. And so uh, I wanted to share about something that inspires me to read the word. Um, but I'm hoping that it's a challenge to us here in the room. And so when we go to read the Bible, there's so many different ways you can read it. There's so many different avenues and, and insights. But today, I want to help us learn how to find Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay, I heard like a little, okay, okay. And so the reason why this is important is because it shows the divinity of God's authorship. That every part was intentionally written by God, not just for them uh, back then, but for us today. It proves that the author of life himself was pointing to Jesus, the messianic king of the Jews who we should follow. And lastly, for those who have been reading the Bible for a while, I'm hoping that this, is, that this helps us have another lens to reading the scriptures. And so again, the equipping of a disciple to maturity is up to God, but I'm just hoping I can inspire thought to take, uh, to take a different angle about the scriptures. All right, guys, so let's dive into it. The very first biblical, uh, literary device that we're gonna be looking at today is foreshadowing, right? And so all foreshadowing is in short, is it's an indication of what was to come, right? Now, there are many times that the scriptures use characters and symbols and um, different things to tell us that there was something that was to come. And once you start to see the foreshadows in the scriptures, it changes your biblical perspective to see all the different connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, the Old Testament is filled with foreshadowing. The Old Testament was a covenant that was made by God to man hundreds of years before Jesus came. And so you can just think of it as a promise, right? The Jews at the time thought that God was promising a king that would bring them back to a promised land, that would give them victories over all their enemies. But God was promising so much more than that. He was promising them a king that would give them victory over sin and bring them into eternal life with him. And see, the Old Testament in many ways was, not, was, was only pointing towards what was to come, um, and what was to come was Christ himself. Hebrews says it this way, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. And so just like the law, there's many, again, golden nuggets within scripture that points towards Jesus be, being on his way. And so the next literary device that I want to go ahead and use so that we can see more foreshadowing was well, actually two in one, okay? So bear with me. It's called anti-type and type. So if you're a Bible nerd, you probably already know where I'm going, but I love this because, oh, you'll see, we're gonna explain. So an anti-type, in short, what it is, it's the source of something, right? And a type is when that source is patterned out or repeated or made again, it's kind of that image that comes along. So I know that this is a lot. I, I broke it down to a simple thought. So here are two hands, right? So if everyone could just put their hand in the air. Go ahead. And so we're going to imagine that there's ink on your hand. Now go ahead and put it down, not onto a neighbor. You could just use yourself or anything. And so if you were to put your hand down with ink on it, there would be an image that comes out, right? And that image would not look exactly like your hand, but it would be smudged or smeared. And the more you kept doing that over and over again, wherever you put your hand, it would fade more. It would look different. It would be sharper or less sharp if you put more ink. And so, but the whole idea is that you know that it was a source. It was a reflection of your actual hand. And so when we look at the Old Testament, Jesus is the anti-type. 
Jesus is the hand, he is the source. And we find all these different characters and symbols throughout scripture and these smudges and these people who look like, man, they were, they were to be great if they just did this one thing right, you know? And if you've read the Old Testament, you feel that a lot. You're like, Samson, come on, man, you got this. But again, we are gonna, we're gonna use this to go ahead and look at it. But for those who um, wanna know more, these are the Bible characters in the Old Testament that are types. Now, this isn't all of them, but Moses was a type. Joshua was a type. Abraham, Daniel, David, Adam. All of these biblical characters were a shadow of what was to come. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to use what we just learned, and we're going to look at the life of Moses. So for those who don't know, Moses was a great man in the Old Testament, but like many of us, he, he fell short. And he was chosen by God himself to lead Israel, which was no easy task, all right? And so we're not talking about a little group of people with some tents. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about millions of people. And these are millions of people who are complaining. They're disobedient. And they're being known as a like stiff-necked, all right? And so Moses had to lead these people across a desert for 40 years, and this is what that journey looked like. So he takes them from Egypt. He, go across, he goes across, um, yeah, this desert for 40 years. And because of their disobedience, it wasn't even supposed to take that long. <laughs> but because they kept complaining and they kept uh, just honestly living in sin, they, God extended it for 40 years to correct them in their disobedience. Um, and even, and Moses fell short because he didn't even get to go what, to where was, what was called the promised land, which is God's plan for them. But the way that we see Jesus and Moses' life, the way we see foreshadowing is this way. <clears throat> There's a symbolism that is part of that journey between Moses, the Israelites, and all the way to the promised land. And so in scripture, the, in Egypt, where they were going from, it was actually a representation of slavery to sin. And in that journey is a conversion process. It's the journey of life. So for us, it's when we're fighting sin, when we're going through the trials and the tribulations of life. But the end goal for them was just a plot of land. But for us, it's an eternal life. And so like Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt into a promised land, Christ is trying to lead all of us out of our own Egypts and into a new land, right? And so the beautiful thing about this, uh, I'm gonna skip past that. The beautiful thing about this is about how it relates to us today, right? We become a type when, when we decide to follow Jesus. We, Jesus is this and on each of us, when we decide to become disciples, we carry that imprint around. And I was asking myself, well, why is this important? It may seem simple, but the answer is simple. No, the world needs Christians. When we become Christians, a major part of our purpose is fulfilled. Another reason that this is important is because we need men and women who love others when they only hate. We need men and women who speak truth when the world is trapped in lies. The world needs people to lead them out of their Egypt and the world is in need of a savior. And it is not that we become that savior for people, but if we take the time to be equipped, if we take to th the time to explore God's word, we can tell them about one. And so God has a plan for each and every one of us, but are we willing to pick up his plan and be equipped by it? So the next literary device I hope to uh, equip us with is symbolism. And so I love symbolism. I feel like it tells so many stories in one. It's like a logo where you see something and you understand the image, but you know that that image is speaking towards something that is, is more, it's representing something, right? So if you see it like Nike, you know it's okay, athletes, it's sports. Their slogan is just do it. And so throughout the Old Testament, you see tons of symbolism. And so what I wanna look at today for symbolism is the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was, in short, a, a huge tent, right, made with curtains and rods, and that was designed by God. So as Moses was leading Israel out of, uh, out of Egypt, he gave them specific instructions to build a portable place of worship, which is called the tabernacle. So the purpose of this was so that God would be dwelling among the people as they traveled, right? 
And so here is a, a, a better breakdown of what that looked like. And, and, and um, the, the bigger view was that there was three main parts. So you have the courtyard, you have the holy place, and you have the holy of holies. And I would love to just dive into all these, but these are like three or four or five sermons on its own. And again, we're just trying to inspire you to take a snapshot, to take a different look at scripture. And so not everyone can even enter into this place, right? Only the priesthood could. And so this is not, uh, oh wait, okay, here we, go. here we go. So here's some symbolism. So this is what the breakdown of all the objects inside the tabernacle look like. And there's symbols that will foreshadow who Christ is. So stick with me. Are you guys are with me? Okay. So the way that this breaks down is that when you entered into the tabernacle, there was a gate. And once you walked in, there was an altar in which people would sacrifice, or the, or the holy priesthood would sacrifice animals to God, right? You have something called a laver, which was a big basin of water, right? And then as you continue on, you enter into the holy place, which had different objects like bread and wine and altar and incense, a, memora, a menorah that was filled with lights. And then you would enter, uh, only one person could actually enter into the holy of holies. And so this is not just a tabernacle, but it was a prescription for what it looked like to enter into heaven, into the holy of holies. And for us, it's a prescription of also what discipleship looks like. So there's a chart. Uh, I made this. If you want to go ahead and take a picture, I'm not going to read all of it. But that gate, Jesus talks about it in John. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. The altar of burnt offerings, John 1, 29, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So there's the altar which Christ was sacrificed, right? The laver, it's, a, it's a, a symbolism for baptism. And once we have died to ourselves, once we have decided to follow Jesus, then we go into the waters to wash away our sins. We have bread and wine, which represents communion and so on and so forth. But the one I want to dive into specifically for today, as far as symbolism goes, is the Holy of Holies. So the Holy of Holies was the third section of the tabernacle. So let me just pull us all the way back in here. Okay, so here's section one, here's section two, right? So the outer courtyard, the holy place. And then the third section was the Holy of Holies. And so only one priest who was chosen could go in there one time a year, only once, right? <clears throat> and so this was the third section of the tabernacle. It was the innermost section, and it was the most sacred part of the tabernacle. It was so holy, and it was so filled with the presence of God that if you went in there and you weren't supposed to, you would die, like, instantly, and priests would even wear a rope around their leg, like their ankle, because if they accidentally died, they would use this rope to pull them out of the room. So you didn't have to go in to try to get a body and then you died and now there's two bodies, right? You use this, you use this rope and, and you're able to pull the person out. And so, yeah, so you're able to pull this person out, right? And so when they walked into the Holy of Holies, which is this room right here, there was the Ark of the Covenant, but right before was the veil. And so the symbolism for the Holy Holies is entering into the presence of God. And if you were not the right person, if you weren't clean of your sin, if you weren't chosen by God to enter into that place, again, you would die. But the way that Jesus intervenes for us is that he is the perfect sacrifice. He is the high priest. And he's the reason why we now are able to dwell with God literally without dying, you know, or we're able to have a relationship with him. And I was looking for some words to figure it out and how could I paint the illustration, but man, Hebrews, again, he just, it just puts it so well. I thought I had it, but I'll just read it for you guys. It's Hebrews 10, 20, and this is what it says. By a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, so through the veil, that is his body, and which we have a great priest over the house of God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And so because of the death of Jesus, we get to dwell with God. And the, the other part about this is like, I guess like an extended fun fact is that 
we don't have to build things anymore to be close with God. But instead, God, he, when we die with him, when we're buried with him in baptism, he decides to live in us. And that these are the things that I love about scripture is that, man, you get to see the artistry of God, but you also get to see that there's so many ways that he's been just trying to show you he loves you and he wants to be close with you. Like how much closer can you get besides living inside of a person, you know? So our last one for today is prophecy. We're gonna be looking at this. So the Western usage of the word prophecy is very different from the normal sense that it's given in the Bible, right? To the Jews, a prophet was not so much one who predicted the future, instead he or she was an instrument to reveal God's will for his people. The prophets of Israel were ones who spoke for God and they were messengers for God. In general, their mission was twofold. It was to give warnings of the judgment on Israel and her enemies and to encourage God's people to repent of their hard-hearted sin. So in the Old Testament, a, pro- uh, a prophecy is most general, s- sorry, lost, my, lost myself there. But in and, 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 and short, the prophets, if they were to go um, to Israel and preach, all of their message was from God. And it even says, if you claim to be a prophet and you went to go preach something and you said it was prophecy, you would actually end up dying because this was a holy practice. This was like God sending someone. And so today we have so many people who claim to be prophets and that that consequence doesn't happen right away. But if you were again to not tell the truth in the Old Testament, then you were, were to be killed. And so the scripture that I wanted to look at for us today is Isaiah 53, verse four through nine. And this will show us that like Isaiah, who was a prophet for Israel, was preaching and was uh, trying to give a foreshadowing of who was to come. And the reason I use this scripture is because I feel like it's the easiest one to see that he's clearly talking about Jesus, right? So let's take a look at it together. Isaiah 53, four through six, it says, "'Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid him on him the iniquity of us all. Continuing on, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like lamb, like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his yet who of his his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And so the reason this is prophecy is because it was foretold. When Isaiah is writing this, this is around 700 years before Jesus was even born. But it's so clear. He doesn't even say Jesus, right? But you can tell that this is exactly what happened at the crucifixion. Christ died for our transgressions, right? He took on our iniquities. And so the scriptures is foreshadowing the, 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 the death of Jesus on the cross. But it, what it's also explaining is that he is the Messiah. He is the king. He is the one who was to come. And so um, in short, that's our short like Bible study for today. That's our biblical lesson. But I wanna encourage you guys like, be men and women who are equipped. I wanna encourage you guys to prioritize reading the Bible. Uh, like you prioritize going to the gym or being at work on time, like the Bible should have the greatest importance in our lives. Finding things in scriptures, I hope that you can, you can explore it for yourself, you know? These are the things that I'm passionate about. These are things that wake me up in the morning or when I'm tired and I don't wanna read my, my Bible, I can go to something like this. Um, but I hope that you guys can find whatever it is in the scriptures that God is trying to speak to you. And again, I want us to just leave us with this question. God wants to speak to us, 
but do we want to listen? Amen? Amen. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is, is dive into communion. And so as many of you know, we, we take the bread, the symbolism, the bread that represents the body and the wine that represents Jesus' sacrifice, but it's not wine, it's like grape juice. Um, and we just remember what Christ has done for us. And as we meditate on this time, I, want, I hope that you guys can think about the Egypts that God has brought you through or the things that he's trying to bring you through. And through all that, I pray that you can trust in his plan. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Um, Father, thank you so much for this time, just to be able to uh, talk about symbolism, to talk about prophecy, to talk about the different types. And um, Lord, I pray uh, that we can dive into your word. Uh, we had so many people come to church and so many people become Christians this year. But I pray as we move forward on to next year, on some more things that we can be men and women who truly are just in love with your word and dedicated to it. Father, there's nothing um, that we want to do without you, and there's nothing that um, we believe can be done without you, God. I pray that we continue and we do our best to try to give you all the glory, um, that none of this uh, is from us. And I pray, God, that you just continue to be with us. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.